Hi students, welcome to this um, video which is actually explaining about the corrections for the May holiday homework 1. Now you can actually use the timestamp that is found in the description box below to fast forward to the questions that you got wrong. So there's no need for you to follow through the entire um, video because it's actually quite long and there might be some questions that you already know how it works. So without further ado, let's get started. Now you can have a full scan with you to actually write down some of the comments that I'm writing down on the questions. Eventually, all these questions will be printed out for you and you can actually um, attach your full scan back to the question paper itself. Let's start with the first question. Which of the following actually describes the study of meteorology? Now, meteorology, just want to emphasize on this word. Although, at first, when you look at this, right, it looks like meteor, which is something that falls off from the space. Okay, but it's actually not um, what it's meant for. Now, the study of planets, stars, and other bodies in space, right, is actually called astronomy. Okay, but the study of weather conditions is actually what we call meteorology. Yeah, so um, it's actually a study of how weather and climate actually changes. In terms of option A, it's actually what we call geography. And option B, it's actually what we call biology. So it's good to actually um, read out a bit more about each of them. To actually find out what exactly do they encompass. Of course, in the secondary school science, right, we're actually focusing on just physics, chemistry, and biology. Um, for question 2, now which of the following is not an abuse of technology? Now for some of you here who um, might not have noticed this word of is not an abuse of technology, okay, please take note that you are supposed to find the one that is actually um, helpful, that is not harmful. So over here the answer is actually B. Also want to point out that in this entire video, what I will do is that I will actually be highlighting the correct answer, so you can take note of what exactly is the answer. Using ultrasound is actually good because it actually allows you to know whether something is wrong with the kid or not, and actually allows the mothers to make certain decisions. The one that most of us choose, which is not correct, is actually option D. Now, what is the issue with option D? Now, option D refers to the inappropriate use of antibiotics. Of course, all of us know that antibiotics is a good thing, but if you use it inappropriately, which, for instance, it could mean that if used excessively that means if you keep taking antibiotics for no reasons or if you keep applying antibiotics to certain crops okay for no reason right you just keep using a lot and a lot it will actually result in what we call disease resistant bacteria or disease resistant bugs and this can sometimes be known as super bugs if you're interested you can go and google about this basically these are referring to organisms that eventually develop an immune uh, response that can fight against these antibiotics. So it means your antibiotics are actually useless. La. Moving on to question 3, which of the following is an inference. Now an inference refers to something new that we can actually work out based on an observation. So you actually have, need to have an observation first before you can have an inference. If you look at all these three uh, all these four answers, the first three, right, they are actually what I call observation because it's based on what you see. The last one, by saying that it has strong muscles or it runs fast, is an inference. It's something that you guess based on what you look at and based on what you observe. So this is for question three. And the answer is D. For question four, the answer is B. Okay, so the question four is actually asking you for which of the following is actually correct. So you cannot eat and drink in the laboratory is actually a correct measure. Now, if you look at option one, right, it says that you can throw solid waste into the sink. We all know that this is not good because it will obstruct the sink or it can cause blockage. So this is something that you can take note of. You can elaborate a bit on what is going to happen. You should point the mouth of test tubes at others during heating. For option C, this is wrong also because the liquids might spill out. Okay, and if the liquid is hot, right, it might even burn your friend. Of course, last but not least, if you look at option D, it doesn't make sense because you are supposed to use a test tube holder to hold the test tube while it's heating. For question 5, the answer over here is actually answer C. Now, some of you are quick to judge and you can know that it's not right for a student to straight away guess the conclusion for, re for doing the experiment once because this is not enough. And we usually have to conduct a few repeated experiments and then we take an average, right? So this is actually something that is recommended because each time when you do an experiment, right, um, you might have 
certain um, mistakes. You want to repeat as many times as possible to make sure that um, you try to get the same conclusion that you avoid having the problems over here. So usually we will conduct repeated experiments. Now for the other options over here, which is one that a lot of students actually chose, many students chose option A because they say that actually you're not supposed to share the findings with your friends. But I want to emphasize over here that in this sentence, sharing refers to presentation. That means you share your work with your friend, present to the whole class. Okay, so this is not like you gossip with your friends, but you're actually presenting to the school, sharing your knowledge with the school, for instance. Right, so this is about presentation. And pre presentation is actually a part of scientific method. Moving on to question 6. Now, question 6 is also a question that most students got it wrong. But I don't blame you guys because we seldom use this part of the Vernier caliber. Okay, the answer is actually option B. Okay, so I'm going to explain the use over here that um, Vernier caliber, if you recall, is the one that looks like this. Okay, so you realize that there's a certain jaw. There's an internal jaw and there's an external jaw. Okay, I can't draw it properly, but this should be how it looks like. And there should be a main scale. And for those of you who still recall, you can actually stretch out this thin strip at the back in a Vernier caliber. This is actually what I call the tail. This one over here are what I call the jaws. So that's the internal jaw and that's the external jaw. The tail is actually used to measure depth. How deep is the solution? How deep is the biggest uh, depth? The jaws is actually used to measure diameters, be it internal diameter or external diameters. So it's usually used for something as round or whatnot. Okay, so the, in this question, you're supposed to measure the internal depth of a test tube. So you're not supposed to use the external jaw. But you do need to use the tail, that's number one. Secondly, you always check for zero error before you start. And when you are reading the readings, please make sure there's no parallax error. With that, we'll move on to question seven. For, for question seven, right, it's ultimately asking you to know why exactly is this apparatus, so I'm not going to go through too much. And over here, this is just a measuring cylinder. There's nothing much to elaborate over here. For question 8, the volume that should be present is actually 14. Now, for this question, right, I want to remind you that whenever you're reading the liquid, right, you always read at the bottom of the meniscus. The meniscus is the bent uh, surface. So you always look at it over here. And then, because in this measuring cylinder, if you look at the interval, each interval is 2 cm cubed. So you can use this to base on and to find out what's your answer. Moving on to question 9. For question 9 itself, it's a recap on SI unit. So just very quickly, length, the SI unit is actually meters. So with that, I just want to go one step further. Volume, what do you think is the SI unit? Since volume is equivalent to length times breadth times height, we're actually looking at a meters unit times a meters unit times a meters unit. So you're actually looking at cubic meters for volume. For mass, the SI unit is actually kilograms. So now that you are calculating the SI unit for density, which is equivalent to mass over volume, naturally it will be kilograms over meter cube. Because if you look at it, for volume, you are looking at meters cube. This is for volume, you are looking at meters cube. So this reading or rather this unit is actually written as kilograms per meter cube and the answer over here is actually option B. For question 10, C is quite direct. This is how you prevent parallax error. You just look at it top down perpendicular to the scale. Question 11, a person can actually float in the Dead Sea. Just to recap, floating. When something floats, the substance actually has a lower density than the substance it is placed in. So in this case, if you place the person in the Dead Sea, right? So if the person has a lower density than the Dead Sea, you actually float. So over here, the answer is actually option C. Okay, that the density of the seawater is actually much higher than the person's density. Now for question 12, right? Actually, everyone in the class got it wrong. So let's really take a bit of time to understand how do we actually come about converting these units. Now, what you might not have realized this is that for this particular conversion, right, you need to understand a bit more about why exactly is it written in the form of meters cubed. So let me give you one example. If one meter is equivalent to 100 centimeters, we can also say that one meter cubed is equivalent to one meter 
multiply by one meter, multiply by one meter. And this will actually give me my one meter cube. And that's how you actually get the meter cube, that, uh, the unit itself. But another way to look at it is one meter cube can also be written as 100 cm times 100 cm times 100 cm. And with this conversion, you realize that one meter cube is actually equivalent to this amount of cm cube, which is one million cm cube. Okay, so this is actually how the calculation comes about. Not just you take one, okay, so some of you, right, you just assume that uh, one meter is 100 cm, right? So if it's one meter cube, I just put a cube. So I just write as 100 cm cube. And this is actually a wrong way of looking at the question. So let's try another example and see if you can follow what's going on. Let's now maybe assume, and let's say 1 mm, okay? 1 mm is equivalent to 0 0.1 cm. So what exactly is 1 mm cubed in terms of cubic centimeters? So you will take 0 0.1 cm times 0 0.1 cm times 0 0.1 cm, and this will actually give you 0 0.001. CM cube. And there you have it. That's actually how you do the conversion. So next time you might come across more of such questions. So always keep in mind that it's not as easy uh, as just putting a tree on one side and then put a tree on the other side and that's it. Then it's done. So same thing you can apply it to meter square, centimeter square, so on and so forth by using the same um, uh, method of doing all this calculation. So just take note of this part. For question 13, let's try to interpret what's going on. Solid A actually has twice the mass of solid B but both actually have the same volume. So let's try to give it some random values so it's easier to calculate. Let's assume that for solid A, okay, let's say that the mass, let's put it as because it's twice of solid B, right? Let's say that the mass is 2 kg. Okay, and let's say that the volume is um, maybe 1 meter cube. Okay, then for solid B, because the question say that the volume is the same, right? Let's say that the volume is 1 cubic meter. Then the mass, because it's not as much as solid A, so the mass is actually only 1 kg. So if you were to calculate the density of each of them, you realize that the density for solid A is actually equivalent to 2 kilograms divided by 1 cubic meters, which will give you 2 kilograms per cubic meter. But that for solid, so i just shift this up a bit, that for solid B, it's actually equivalent to 1 kilograms divided by 1 cubic meters, which gives you 1 kilogram per cubic meters. So you realize that the density for solid A is actually um, different from that of solid B. In fact, the density for solid A is actually twice that of solid B. So the answer over here is actually B. Okay, I realized I forgot to mention about the answer for question 12. The answer is actually option D. And with that, let's move on to the next question on question 14. Alright, now let's take a look at question 14. Now question 14, right, is actually trying to check whether you are familiar with how to read the volume on the measuring cylinder. And how can you actually deduct the respective volume. So if we just look at the last measuring cylinder itself, right, we realize that the volume that is shown over here is actually 64 cm cube. On the second one, if you look closely, it's actually 56 cm cube. And for the first one, if you look closely, it's actually about 30 cm cube. So it's good to take note of what is going on because if you look at the second and the third one, right, the difference is actually about this um, piece of plus, uh, pebbles. Okay, so basically from this, I can tell that the pebbles volume is actually equivalent to taking 64 minus 56. Remember the Eureka experiment, right? This is the displacement that's done by the pebble itself. So this will give me an 8 cm cube. Volume. That means the pebble actually has 8 cm cube in terms of volume. If I look at the first measuring cylinder, I will know that the volume of water that was inside is actually 30 minus 8, which is equivalent to 22 cm cube. Alright, and now we'll take a look at um, question 15. Okay, so for question 15, it's actually on Bernier caliber. So just want to recap a bit, right? When you read the reading over here, you need to remember that there is two different scales. Okay, the bigger one is actually called the main scale. And the one at the bottom, which only has 10 um, intervals, right, is called the vernier scale. So in the vernier scale, right, what you do is that you actually have to take note of the reading and you base it on how the main scale ends, which is over here. And look at it, if this is 0 at the left side, this will be 0 0.1, so on and so forth. 
until you reach this particular point, which is supposed to be 0 0.6 something. How do you know what is the value of the something? You look out for the line that actually matches the line that's on the mean scale as well as the Bernier scale, which is over here. This line actually matches. And if you take a reading from the Bernier scale over here, this is actually the fourth point from the start, which means that this is actually a 0 0.04 cm uh, measurement. That means this entire reading, right? The actual reading is actually 0 0.64 centimeters. But since there's a positive zero error of 0 0.4, sorry, 0 0.04, in the case of a positive zero error, what you'll do is that, um, okay, so let me just change a bit. This is actually the original reading before you factor into the zero error. But if you correct it with the corrected reading, taking into account the zero error, you're actually supposed to remove away the positive error which means to minus 0 0.04 and you end up with 0 0.60 centimeters so those of you who are looking at this question right if you're not sure about what exactly is it about we to recap a bit about your vernier caliber of course take note that there's also such a thing called negative zero error and negative zero error is slightly more confusing in terms of how you calculate it so you might want to take out your notes to go and revise about it okay moving on to question 16. now for question 16 right it says that plastic floats in pure water. So just a recap, if something floats, okay, a less dense object will float on a denser object. So using this as an example, I will know that plastic is actually less dense than water as well as salt water if you read the whole set of instructions. But it seems to sink in paraffin oil, which means that plastic is denser than paraffin oil. Okay, so these are just some things that you can identify from the question itself. Which of the following shows the arrangement in increasing density? Increasing means you go from the lowest to highest. Okay, from low to high in terms of the density. So since plastic is less dense than water and salt water, I would expect pure water and salt water to have a higher density than plastic, right? So I expect pure water and salt water to be on the right side of plastic. But since plastic is denser than paraffin oil, I will expect plastic to be slightly more towards the right than paraffin oil. So the lowest density one, right, is actually paraffin oil, followed by plastic. Now, how do you differentiate pure water and salt water? Okay, it's important for us to remember that salt water actually contains salt dissolved in water which means it actually has more um, particles in a unit volume or rather it has more metal in a unit volume because within the water itself right there's salt that's trapped within the water itself so it actually has more metal in a unit volume and you remember that density is actually mass over volume so you expect the salt water right to have a higher mass than pure water because it actually has the salt mass inside as well. So the salt water's density should be higher in this case. Moving on to question 17. Question 17 is quite clear cut. You just need to remember that you cannot use a dichotomous key to categorize your living and non-living things. Okay, dichotomous key is always, always only for living things. Yeah, so this is the only part that you need to know of because most of you who chose wrongly, right, you chose D. And of course, the economist key allows you to categorize it into two subgroups at each time. Now, we don't accept option A because not all dichotomous key can be easily interpreted. Some of it is very complicated, some of it is a lot easier, but not all of them are very easily interpreted. Moving on to question 18. Question 18, vertebrates are the ones that have backbones. This is quite clear cut, so there's nothing much to talk about it over here. Question 19, which of the following is not a fish? Now, dolphin is not a fish because dolphin is actually one of the types of sea mammal. Okay? And that means they will actually reproduce, so we just recap a bit, reproduce by giving birth, not by laying eggs, huh? because fishes will lay eggs. And likewise, they will also be able to breathe through their lungs, not through gills. Okay, that's why for your dolphins, right, when they want to breathe, they actually have to get onto the top surface of the water. 
so that the air hole at the top of their head can actually take in the air. Okay, so your dolphin is not a type of fish, whereas the other three are all types of fish. Stingray is actually a type of fish, huh? if you go and research a bit about it. Question 20. This is a new organism. It has dry scaly skin. Now, when you see dry scaly skin, scaly, right, there can only be two different kinds. It's either a fish or a reptile. But since it's dry and it lives on land, it must be a reptile. Okay. In fact, the question also went on further to tell you that, okay, the eggs, right, actually have thick, hard shells. So knowing that it's dry and scaly, right, it must be a reptile already. And the rest of the information actually helps to support that. Moving on to question 21. Now for question 21, it's crucial to take note of what's the meaning of hard. Okay, we went through it previously, but hardness, right, is a sign of the ability to cut. So don't confuse hardness with strength. So one of the hardest objects in the world, right? The natural object in the world that's the hardest, right? It's actually a diamond. So it's impossible for steel to be harder than diamond itself. Um, and another thing that you might want to take note of is that wood actually has a low density. Why is that the case? Just imagine, most of the time, if you saw wood in a water body, right? Wood tends to float on water. And why is that the case? It's because there is a lot of air pockets within the wood structure. As a result of that, it gives it overall a low density, so the entire thing tends to float. So that is for wood itself, because there's a lot of tiny air spots within the entire structure. And most of the time, this is what will be the case, lah, because um, it's, very, it's not uniform within the entire wood. Moving on to question 22, which one of the following rocks will actually turn hot fastest? Now, a lot of students who got this wrong chose B, because they think of wood, right? So most of you are thinking that, okay, wood will catch fire if you leave it to high heat. But I want to clarify right now that flammable or flammability, the ability to catch fire, is not the same as conduction of heat. Let me give you one example. You know the pots they use at home, right? The pots are made out of steel, and the steel actually conducts heat very easily, but they don't catch on fire, right? So this actually shows you that flammability is the ability to burn. Conduction of heat is the ability to transfer heat. How can you move the heat so that you move it in the fastest way? That will mean that the rock will actually turn hot the fastest. So we're actually looking for a material that is the best at conducting heat. And what other one then? Copper. Because copper is actually a type of metals. And metals all have a high ability to conduct heat. So copper will tend to turn hot faster. Question 23. When different materials are being scratched with diamond, like what I mentioned at the very, very start, once you're trying to scratch, once you're trying to cut something else, you're actually measuring hardness, not strength. Strength is actually a measurement of whether the structure, or whether the material can support mass. Okay, whether it can support other substances. For instance, the bench is very strong because it can support a lot of people sitting on it, right? Doesn't mean that the bench is actually very hard. The hardness is a measurement of whether you can scratch or cut something. Question 24. Elements in the same group in the periodic table. Okay, this is something that you need to know. The elements that's found in the same group, they all share similar chemical properties. Now, those of us who chose A or B will be wrong because if you look at your periodic table itself, if you focus on group 3, so you look at the column that says group 3, right? You realize that within itself, you will find metals at the top and you'll find non-metals at the bottom. And in fact, for those of you who are uh, who have read up a bit more, you'll know that you can find what we call metalloids over here also, which are elements that have a bit of both properties. So it's not right to say that as long as the elements in the, is in the same group, it must all be metals or it must all be non-metals. In fact, you, are, you have groups that is actually has a mixture of either metals or non-metals, or even metalloids. But one thing that you can be certain is that they tend to react in the same way. So for example, if you look at group 3 itself, right, you'll see this thing called boron, you also will see this thing called aluminium, and you'll see some other elements. Now, we will know that since they're in the same group, most likely they are going to have similar chemical reactions. So if you expect boron to react with a type of substance, aluminium most likely will also react with a type of substance. 
the exact reason we actually exploit in the next chapter on atomic structure. Let's move on to the next question. Question 25. Now question 25 requires you to know what are some examples of compound and element. I just want to clarify right now that everyone here should remember that alloys are a type of mixture. Okay, so what are alloys? Alloys are things like bronze, steel, brass, etc. So all these are actually all mixtures. So don't confuse yourself with what it's supposed to be. And another thing I want to clarify is that um, sugar is actually a compound. Okay, most of you might not have read up about this, but sugar is a type of compound. Muddy water is actually a mixture. Why? Because muddy water actually has sand and water inside, and the sand doesn't dissolve, which means that you're looking at, more specifically, a suspension. Air is also a mixture. And air is actually a mixture of many gases, like oxygen gas, carbon dioxide gas, nitrogen gas, etc. So I'm just writing all these things, which is called the formula of um, substances, which you'll learn in the next chapter as well. Moving on to question 26. Now in question 26, we're actually exploring what exactly is involved in distillation. I'm just going to show you a brief drawing of what it looks like for distillation and you see if you can recall um, this part that you have learned before. So for distillation, right, there's always a flask at the start. This will actually bring it to a particular tube that's called a condenser. Okay, the condenser has uh, certain points for water to go in and go out. And then you can collect the whatever thing they're supposed to collect over the other side. And over here, there's a thermometer. Okay, so usually this is how distillation works. Okay, it's a, quite a bad drawing, but you get the idea. So how distillation works is that you will first heat up over here. And when you heat it up, what you're trying to do is to get the liquid to start to boil. You want the liquid to boil so that you move up and you move through this condenser. In this condenser, right, temperature is very low. That means condensation will happen because it's cold, right? So whatever water vapor that you have that has boiled previously, when it enters here, you start to condense. So you're actually looking at two different process between boiling and condensation. Now, those of us here who chose option D, sublimation, I just want to explain to you that this process called sublimation is actually referring to a change from solid to gas directly. So, in order for sublimation to happen, we are saying that Look, in this container at the start, okay, in this container at the start, it must only be solid. When you heat it up, it straight away becomes gas, so the solid cannot even melt. So this is a special process that is called sublimation. We are going to read up about this, but I can give you one example right now, which is dry ice. You go and Google about how dry ice works, and it should give you a better idea of how sublimation is. Moving on to question 27. Now, all the elements are basic unit of metal. There's nothing much to explain over here. It's just part of the definition. Moving on to question 28, likewise, mixtures can be separated by physical means. This is something that all of us know. Some example of physical means will be magnetic attraction, filtration, and whatnot that you have learned. Moving on to the next question. Now, a solution is made up of a solute and a solvent. Just a revision. Solute refers to a substance that dissolves in another so most of the time, in your context, is a solid that will dissolve in a liquid. The solvent is the substance that dissolves another substance. Which means that most of the time in your syllabus, solvent is all the liquids, like the water, the oil, etc. Where the solid actually dissolves inside. Last but not least, the very, very last question, suspension. Now, suspension is different from solution. And one of the main things that's different between the two of them is that for suspension and solution, if you look at it in terms of appearance, it will be quite obvious to you. Because in suspension, there will be tiny or even um, bits of solids floating. That means it's not dissolved. Whereas in solution, you'll see clear and there shouldn't be any solids that's floating around and whatnot. Look at these four options. Wine, salt water, pure water, muddy water. Which is the one that's most likely like a suspension. And the only answer that you arrive at is actually option D. And with that, we have come to this end of this, all these revision questions. So what you can do is to take note of the little um, concepts that you need to know for each of the questions. And if you're still not sure, please feel free to consult your teachers when you're back in school. That's all. Thank you.